So hello, thank you for joining us today. My name is Grace Gayoso. I'm more known as Gayo, and I'm the Asia Region Knowledge, Man Manage Knowledge Management Officer for the Knowledge Success Project. And I'm very excited to be facilitating this conversation today for the Knowledge Success Project and the Contraceptive Technology Innovation Exchange or CTI Exchange, because both of them, both are focused on sharing information and bringing people together in the field of family planning. So as some of you may already know, the CTI Exchange is hosting this year a series entitled Beginning with the End in Mind. And this series actually explores um, how we can more purposefully and effectively take steps to ensure accessibility, acceptability, affordability, and equity throughout all stages of contraceptive research, development, and product introduction. And one very important and timely topic uh, related to this series is self-care. And today I have the honor to be joined by a few of our colleagues from the Population Council who recently um, published a commentary um, an article in Contraception titled Addressing Contraceptive Needs Exacerbated by COVID-19, A Call for Increasing Choice and Access to Self-Managed Methods. So for today's conversation, I have a challenge for our guest today. We all know from the workshop um, led by Knowledge Success that right now, uh, most people working in the field of family planning are overwhelmed with too many information. Our brains have too much to process in our workday and even in our everyday lives. So the challenge is um, for your answers, if you can say more with less. Right? And then um, when you can explain technical terms, when you use it, Let's make it easier for our viewers and our peers to process this very important information that we are going to share. All right. So again, welcome. Welcome to Lisa, Saumia, and Harriet. And I will let you each introduce yourself as you answer the initial question, which is, what motivated you to write this commentary about self-care and increasing access to self-managed contraceptive methods? And why now? All right. So who wants to answer the question first? I'm happy to answer the question first. All right. Thank so, you, Lisa. Um, my name is Lisa Haddad. I am medical director at the Center for Biomedical Research at the Population Council and in OBGYN. So what motivated us to write this commentary? Around the time we started writing this commentary, we were concerned by the frightening estimates of how COVID would impact family planning and contraceptive access. Estimates that have since become real with people across the globe unable to meet their reproductive health needs. The COVID pandemic has shed light on the growing pressures and vulnerability in the healthcare infrastructure, exacerbating barriers to reproductive health access and leading to suspension in clinical services and disruption of supply chains. So while provider dependent and large methods merit investment and are really important in the method mix, these methods have not met the needs of women globally. And so Inspired by the surge in remote telehealth, online health resources, and eagerness of individuals to seek solutions to healthcare needs without relying solely on health, the healthcare system, the options for contraception that are self-managed are limited. So we have some great options out there, but they may not be available to all women in all regions. And subsequently, there may also be challenges for some women not necessarily finding the methods that they need and the choices that they have. So our in inspiration for writing the commentary was really to shed light on this gap, both in access as well as in the methods that are available. All right, thank you, Lisa. Any, um, how about for Saumia? Sure, like Gayo. Th thank you for inviting us. Uh, my name is Saumia Ramarao, and I'm a senior associate at the Population Council. When we started writing this commentary, we wrote it at the time when the pandemic was, I would say, perhaps almost in full bloom. We were beginning to see how the effects were playing out. And uh, as you can imagine, 
like everybody else, we felt compelled to want to do something to improve the lives of people while we were going through this once in a lifetime type of uh, situation. And, and we were learning from what people were telling us that there were lockdowns in so many countries. Uh, people were not able to go to health facilities to get care, uh, if care was even provided at all. Uh, the, we had heard about the, all the disruptions in supply chains. And more, moreover, people, whether they were men, women, uh, young uh, boys and men, and, and uh, women, they, there was a fear of visiting health facilities. So, you know, that was the sort of atmosphere that uh, we began thinking about what can we do as public health researchers who work in contraceptive R&D to figure out what, what is our contribution at this moment in time. So that was one big uh, aspect of the why we wrote the commentary at that time. The second one was that the WHO had issued some new guidance on self-care. And what that did was it gave us a framework, it gave us language, it gave us concepts on, on self-care. And so that allowed us to, to place the argument for contraceptive R&D within the ongoing conversations from a policy point of view as to where does self-care fit in uh, the overall public health system. And at the end of the day, what is it that we want to do? We want to improve the journey of a health consumer while they figure out what options to use and how best to achieve the best health outcome for themselves. And, and what's the role of the health system to help them on, the, on their uh, health journey? And in this case, the, their family planning journey. So those were the, some of the, the ideas that we were thinking about when we wrote this paper. All Thanks, right. Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Samia. So that's very interesting, uh, improving the journey of health huh, for the people. And it's very timely because of the framework that suddenly came out from the WHO. So just in the right time. How about for Harriet? What are your uh, thoughts on this? Uh... Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Harriet Birunji. I'm Vice President, International Program uh, Population Council, but, but based in Nairobi. So the question is what really triggered us to think about self-care uh, and contraception. Um, I, for me, I think what was really critical was uh, the fear that for all the years we have worked so hard to interest people in family planning and suddenly this desired product had suddenly been disrupted by COVID-19. Um, and of course, the biggest challenge um, from uh, many of the country point of view is that family planning is a public good, normally organized around conventional health facilities, offered by families. You walk in, you get the service. And certainly, the access points were disrupted because of COVID. There was a phobia, people could not just walk in. Now the question is, is that you have a desired service that is no longer available. It meant that we needed to start thinking creatively to start thinking about shifting access. And how does that, what does that mean? We started now looking at the guidelines of what uh, most of the international organizations were talking about. Of course, very, very quickly, WHO Reproductive Health program issued guidance on and recommendation for offering family planning in the context of COVID. UNFPA, there were so many guidelines. But of course, the challenge is then how do you make this a reality on the ground? Um, because there's the guideline, but to get them the idea down is, is really the, the biggest challenge. So in our article, we're really trying to, first of all, engage with everybody on the discourse of self-care, we really wanted to see what options really exist and how can those options then be delivered to the person who is looking for a family planning method within the context of COVID-19. 
So this is sort of like the purpose of the article is to really engage people to move from the guideline level to really the options that exist and how can we make this a reality in terms of shifting access to the people that really need it. All right. So that's very true because usually that's correct. There are many guidelines that, you know, that it comes out, there are much framework, but the reality on how to implement in the ground, that's the difficulty or the challenge. And now, because of that article, you are pushing for some options that can be done and can make that into a reality with all these disruptions and the access points in the public health facility. So the, my, the next question is, since the focus of this series, as I mentioned, is increasing acceptability, accessibility, affordability, and equity in family planning. So how do you define these terms? How do you define these terms? I'll, I'll ask this question to Saumye. So how do you define these terms? And the second is, how do self-managed methods of contraception contribute to this aim of increasing, again, acceptability, accessibility, affordability, and equity? Thank you, Gayo, for that question, because that's a very important question. Now, you, you talked about four concepts, acceptability, accessibility, affordability, and equity. Now, all these four are interrelated. And to the best of my ability, let me try and give a simple definition the way I understand it for myself. And I hope that uh, our audience uh, finds it useful too. Let's begin with acceptability. Acceptability is what a health consumer feels after they use a product or a service, or if they go to a particular type of service provider. Now, for the purposes of our conversation today, I'll just focus on the product aspect. And what is the overall experience for that particular individual when they use the product? Is it positive? Did they feel comfortable while they were using it? Did it, uh, was it easy to use? Was it convenient? Uh, did it offer for them, for example, perhaps more confidentiality so that nobody else knew that they were using this particular product? So for uh, the case of self-managed contraceptives, the emphasis could be on things such as convenience. This is a product that you can use within the privacy of your own home and uh, you don't need to go to a health facility to obtain it. Uh, it could be products that can be offered through multiple points of care. So it could be at a brick and mortar health facility. It could be through a pharmacy. It could be distributed by a community health worker. So, you know, those are the different attributes of the product, which makes the experience of using it better for the individual uh, who's using it. So for example, when we talk about products and use, we've all heard about the CX or the customer or consumer experience that, that we hear about for in the, in the health, te in the te technology field. So it's almost a similar concept that we're using within the family planning field in, or in public health. This now, leads me to go to the next uh, definition, which is for accessibility. So what is accessibility? It can be either a physical uh, attribute or it can be a social attribute. So when we talk about physical attributes, we mean, is this product available at locations or distances that the health consumer can easily pick, pick the product from? Uh, so, Going back to the point I had raised earlier, is it available at, uh, uh, at community-based distribution units? Uh, is it available through the local pharmacy that's, or a lower level pharmacy that's available in, your, in a particular location? Now, when we talk about the social aspects, you might have 
a very physically accessible location. But if that location was not really friendly to certain types of people who are coming in, if it was not friendly to young men or women who are coming in seeking a particular contraceptive, then it's not really accessible, is it? So we are, when we talk about accessibility, it should include not only the physical aspects of how convenient it is to get to that location, but it's also about, is it really a place where a person would feel comfortable walking in and saying, I need such and such product. So that's all about accessibility. Now, moving from accessibility to affordability, it's more about the economics. Is are these products um, at a price point that health consumers and, and fa families can uh, afford to pay? Is it a price that they're able to pay? And even if they were able, would they be willing to pay? So this is where the acceptability part sort of comes in. For, uh, for the individual who's paying, are the benefits that accrue from using that equal or uh, over uh, or, or uh, way more than the price that they're willing to pay for that? So that's about affordability. And affordability matters, especially when it's around out-of-pocket expenses. So if it's a product that you have to pay on your own and it's not covered by insurance or it's not given for free, that's when affordability as a concept kicks in. Then the final definition you asked me about was about equity. So when we talk about equity, what we mean is, are there differential access or outcomes across different groups of people. And what does that mean? It means, for example, do younger women face more barriers to access family planning products than older women? Or is it that poorer women have more economic barriers than those who are more economically advantaged? <clears throat> and if there are differentials in access, whether it is financial or geographic, or any or age or anything else <clears throat> is there anything that we can do to change that equation to change that imbalance that's where the interventions that focus on equity will try and give a leg up to those who are disadvantaged now i believe self care products have the potential to change that dynamic and why because if let's say some women find that they don't have enough time, they, they are unable to leave their uh, work to go and visit a family planning clinic and spend time in the waiting line for an IUD or an implant, a self-care product that's available at their local drugs, drugstore might make it easier for them to use that family planning product. It gives them convenience. So self-care products, <clears throat> offer the possibility of not only increasing the autonomy of the person over the, its use and stopping use. They can pick it up from any number of health uh, outlets from standard clinics to the local community-based uh, uh, health outpost or uh, uh, or a drugstore in the community. It should, if it is easily accessible, then you're facilitating uptake and continued use. And all of this is likely to happen only if people find the product convenient and easy to use and, and it, that it addresses their needs. So if we do all of this, these aspects combined, then we are on the road to achieving equity. And how do, and you know, you, you would therefore assume that the health outcomes that you achieve would also be equitable. All right. So thank you. I learned a new word today. I hope our viewers learned a new, new word today, CX, consumer experience. I think uh, all products, it should all be about 
consumer experience. And you're right. I'll just summarize. Acceptability, it's about convenience. Accessibility, not only is the product available near the consumer, but also are they comfortable, that place? Is it comfortable for them? Affordability at a price point that they can pay if it's not for free. And equity are those that are disadvantaged also have access. So I think these four concepts overlap. With each other. Am I, am I correct? They, they do overlap. And like the, as you said, these self-care products um, has all these, uh, it's possible to have these. It could be accessible, it's access, accessible, affordable, and it also like have this concept of equity. Now, talking about self-care products because we're also interested what are these um, self-care products probably i'd ask lisa now so what are some self-managed methods in the pipeline or that currently have limited market availability like for persons like me i also don't know that you are excited about and why so probably we can start with what what is self-care what are self-care products and what is something that we don't know that excites you about and why? So that's a great question. I think it's important to know what the larger scheme of what may be available, however, may not be available to individuals. So there are certain um, options that are out there, such as pills that are often widely available. Um, fertility awareness-based methods could also be considered a self-care method, although not necessarily something that's marketed, but information is something that people can obtain online in order to use it appropriately um, and um, enhance the ability for it to be effective. Then you have vaginal rings and patches. And there, you know, the Anavera is a newer one that was recently um, approved for use, but the availability is not quite out there yet. And so people may not have access to vaginal rings, but these can be used for a user controlled method that they can start and stop. And similarly, you have um, sub Q depot, which is something that individuals don't need to go to a provider to get their shot. They can actually administer it to themselves at home. And so these are some of the methods that are out there that aren't necessarily available. Both access and information about these methods may be limited. Also within the aspect of pills, you have emergency contraceptives as well, which sort of fall under that. And access is often challenging in certain areas. And, um, you know, that's an area for improvement that is pretty exciting and a lot of um, opportunity there for really enhancing self-care options for women. And then there are many things that are in the pipeline, some earlier on in the pipeline and some that are closer to the, um, to the point where it can actually hit the market. So you have um, certain things under development that are enhancing the actual formulation to, to make it usable by individuals. So for example, there are microarray patches or microneedle patches, which are a patch that you can put on the skin. You push in these little needles that are pushed through the surface. They are not painful for individuals. You leave it there for a little while and then you remove the patch and the needles remain under the skin and release hormone or whatever uh, contraceptive is in there over time. And that can be either uh, providing a window of protection or even longer acting protection. There are um, longer self injections that are under, um, that are, um, that are in the pipeline. Those can be for six months or 12 months. Um, and um, there are also a lot of different rings that are under development that both hormonal and non-hormonal options that offer um, an enhanced opportunity for individuals that may have contraindications to estrogen containing methods. And then you have multi-purpose prevention technologies that are really exciting because they offer the opportunity to not only prevent pregnancy, but also prevent HIV or other sexually transmitted infections. So these, um, these are, um, an example of one of these is the dual prevention pill, the DPP, which is one of the options that are even closer to the market than some of the other methods that are out there. And this combines a contraceptive pill, a oral contraceptive, with Truvada um, the, uh, for PrEP. And that combination will eventually hopefully be able to be used in a self-care capacity. Sometimes when you think about adding in HIV prevention, there are other things that may be involved such as HIV testing, but some of these can be employed with other self-care approaches, 
such as home testing, that can really um, allow individuals to take control over their own broad reproductive health needs. And within the concept of self-care, there's also a whole bunch of these on-demand methods that are under development. These include gels, rings, and fast dissolving inserts that can um, be placed prior to sexual intercourse and protect an individual for a period of time after placement. And this is a nice option for individuals who may have infrequent intercourse or want true, just, I just wanna use a method when I want it, when I know I'm having intercourse and I don't want it for the period of time that I'm not. And that's great for people who may have very um, predictable coital patterns and they want to have just something when they need it. And so that ultimately this broader group of these self-care methods that you know are across the pipeline offer people multiple opportunities to meet their needs. And that's really exciting because um, not one woman wants the same thing as another woman. And those needs can change throughout the reproductive lifespan. And it's not unusual for individuals to change their method based on their changing reproductive health needs. Yeah, so that's interesting. There's so many options and right? so many options. I'm just curious about that needle, micro needle patch. So it means anybody can really like put that to themselves. Like, for example, usually for injections, right? It's usually supposed to be like a, like a doctor, a nurse or someone like, is it okay for someone to put that micro needle patch on your own? Yeah, I mean, in, in theory, the thought is that it will be able to be self-administered. It would be something sort of like a Band-Aid. You put on, you push it in. It doesn't necessarily hurt because these are micro needles. And then mm -hmm. it's removed. And it is, it's specifically geared to be a self-administered approach. And so, you know, with new technology and advancements and new formulations, there are new ways that we can meet individuals' needs. And that's super exciting. That's what's exciting about research, R&D, right? For new products, uh, more effective, much better, and answers the needs of the people who are, you know, women or men, different needs, right? So, all right. So now I would like now to ask uh, Harriet, in your opinion, what is the most important action item that people watching this now can take to support the expansion of reproductive health care through self-administered contraceptives, especially as COVID-19 continues to impact communities. Uh, uh, that's a, a very good question. Um, every now and then I think about self-care, I ask myself, where does it belong? in terms of policy, because we need to create an enabling environment and it starts with the policy. Um, and in many cases, when you think about people doing things themselves in the medical world, one could literally think it belongs to the informal sector. What we need really to do is to start engaging with the policy makers so that there's proper guidance, uh, the country level to understand self-care and to enable it to happen uh, in terms of uh, classification of the self-care technologies in, in terms of what kind of information can circulate freely so that women can or men can access that information because when you think about the healthcare system and the social organization of the healthcare system, it's about regulation. It's about who should handle, who shouldn't handle, which information should belong to the, the medical world and which information should let people have access. So we need to have, we need to come to a common understanding of what is permissible within the law and within the policy so that we can enable some of these wonderful technologies to become part and parcel of do it yourself without people being limited. We want to have proper classification at the pharmacies so that when somebody goes in and requests for a self-care product, there are no limitations. There is no request for a prescription. 
Uh, so it's really creating the enabling environment and dialoguing with the policymakers so that we have a common understanding of the concept of self-care. The other thing is that we all need to understand is that family planning by its very nature is about women's social networks. There's nothing that brings women so much together like family planning. When they are considering what to use, they will ask the next friend or they will ask a workmate. It's not the health worker, but they will first check with their friends. So even when they walk into any place, they've already sort of thought about so many things before they even come in. Now, how do we shift these networks to the technologies? How do we shift this network to WhatsApp, to the digital platform so that women can access? Because right now movement is limited. You don't walk in anybody's home. You don't walk into a neighborhood store and stand there for long hours to talk about anything. So then how do we shift the networks to, to faceless technologies where you don't really need a neighbor to tell you, but sort of like shifting that information to the digital application so that a woman can get all the information, ask all the question, and, and then also get connected with the women in her network to verify what she has read so that by the time they walk into a pharmacy or a drugstore, they are able to say, I'm convinced that this is a method for me. So the question is, how do you shift that? How do you shift the policy discourse? How do you shift the networks to what is now happening? The other thing is about choice. Lisa has talked about all this range of products, but not every woman have, has access to these technologies. How then do we increase choice? And this is not choice for the sake of it. When you talk about products like Annabella, there's value added to it. It's a long acting method. In most of our context, we have like three choices for long acting methods and many of them are dependent on medical personnel who are no longer available right now. We need to expand choice for long acting self-care methods like Anavela, like all the ranges of things that women can have agency to do it themselves. So we need to invest in product introduction. Uh, this is not just adding any other product, but the products we are talking about are critical. These are things that women are looking for right now. Uh, they are contactless. You do it yourself and you don't have to return every day to a clinic to inquire about what to do and all that. They empower the women to do things themselves. And at the end of the day, they are also not depending on the public institution. So we need to expand choice because when we started talking about this and I walked into a pharmacy in Kenya, what was available for any person who calls in for delivery or for purchase was the condom, the emergency pill, um, and um, the combined pill. And just the choice was so limited. And so we need to make sure that the available choice takes us. You talked about how do we achieve our end. If you are running a family planning program, it's not about getting new users. It's about decreasing the number of unintended pregnancies. What we are seeing right now is very high levels of unintended pregnancies which means that a lot of the needs and desires of women are not being achieved because there's limited choice, there's limited access, and there's also limited information. So we need to make sure that information on these desired products is circulating around where to go, what to do, and all that. So there's a lot of work that is needed to be done beyond the guidance, but to get all these things at the action level. Uh, and this is really urgent and we need investment in these kind of things. 
I would just like to ask probably anyone can answer. What do you think are the factors that limits these choices? I mean, you said there was like choices are limited. These are the only things that's available. So what do you think are the factors that limits these choices or availability of these new technologies to women? Well, if I can come in as fast, um, I'll sort of also mention that for a long time, family planning, despite the fact that it's a preventive service, it has been demedicalized. And for the first time, we are seeing products that are intended to demedicalize family planning and enable women to do things themselves to prevent unintended pregnancy. So the first barrier has been medicalizing family planning because for any lay woman in my environment, if you want to get a family planning um, product, you have to go to a health facility. Majority of them have to go to a health facility. Now, how then do you shift that mentality, but that access to other outlets where women feel that they can just walk in and get what they want as a preventive service. Yeah, and if I may, uh, Harriet, what I would also add to that is what you were talking about is it's a change of mentality and it requires imagination. Essentially what, uh, what Harriet is also saying when she says demedicalization is we are talking about changing the power dynamic between providers and health consumers. So it's, it's in this dynamic, the provider is not playing the role of the key decision maker, the person who knows more and is advising. But in fact, when you're moving to self-care, self-managed products, we're talking about a shared journey where the provider's role has shifted to being one of supporting the health consumer on their journey. So it's, it's that dynamic is, uh, is what we are all imagining would, would be useful uh, to have, but how easy it will be to achieve that would depend on what our, uh, uh, our uh, comrades and our uh, uh, and our stakeholders in the, in the provider sector feel. So that's why it becomes really important to engage with them and say, reassure them that they still have a role to play, that they're still the, the knowledge experts, they're still the technical experts, but their role would be shifting a little differently because they can indeed trust women and girls to use products because they do know what, what's good for them, what their own values and preferences are for various methods all right so really uh, it's very challenging because like what you said it's a shift in mentality a shift in power dynamics and now what we wanted also is how to shift the network into existing technology how they you know uh, talk more virtually or through apps did i did i get that right harriet like having apps where they can access information because some don't have information. And it's really true because right now uh, what's happening in the field is that some would want to have, you know, to remove um, those contraceptives and then they, they get access because you cannot go out because there's lockdown like in most in Asian countries right now where, where I am from. So that's very um, interesting. And like what you said also, um, not every woman also has access to technology so invest in product information and expanding really the choice like even for me i don't know that you know that there's so much of these different products available and sometimes too much information i'm overwhelmed with choices that's the that's the other uh, spectrum so it would help really to have like what you said um information and access to that and also policy because there could be really good technology people don't know about it and people don't want to regulate it. So too bad for the technology that's been researched and developed for a long time. So almost like marketing. 
All right. So now, um, this is for everyone, right? Um, a very interesting question. If you could create a new self-managed contraceptive method that better addresses the needs of users, what would that look like and what characteristics would it have there? So it's your own choice. You'll create something uh, new. What would it be and how would it look like? All right. So you'll be the what the seller now, <laughs> the vendor of your own creation. <laughs> you will be marketing your own uh, creation. All right. Who would want to go for? Probably Lisa would go first. Lisa, I yes. hope I didn't put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. So I love thinking through these sort of idealistic questions, but in reality, I don't think I would be able to design just one method because. The challenge is that, as I said earlier, things change across an individual's lifespan and no two people want the same thing. That being said, if I were to think of the perfect method, the first thing would be something that'd be easily available with few side effects or any sort of um, contraindications to use. Maybe a non-hormonal method that could be start that could be self-managed. An individual can start and stop, can use it continuously. I think daily adherence is really challenging for anybody. Um, potentially something that also had multi-purpose um, prevention, such as HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. Um, and uh, something that I think um, could easily, you know, once you discontinue it, you could, um, you don't have to, uh, you don't have a delay in a resumption of fertility. Um, something non-hormonal could also offer the option of something that could be started and stopped without really concern for changes in menstrual bleeding because it wouldn't necessarily affect the menstrual cycle and lead to anovulation that hormonal methods would have. So it would offer like the ultimate of user control. So I could use it for a week if I were in a situation and then not use anything for a couple of weeks. So that would be my ideal method. And then there are definitely things in the pipeline that are actually addressing many of these things. They're not that close to consumers, but at this point, and I think a lot of the things that are under development right now, one of the exciting things that have sort of shifted in the um, development um, arena is the importance of the end user early on in product development. And so bringing in, you know, these, um, conversations, for example, are highlighting some of the issues that are being brought up in a lot of the end user research that is highlighting the needs, are highlighting the needs of individuals globally and filling those gaps. And so hopefully many of the things that I've highlighted in the perfect method, so to say, are things that are being heard by the developers and really being integrated in the new methods that are coming out. Super exciting. Yeah, exciting if, they, if that kind of product would come out. <laughs> All right. So now let's go to Saumya. What is your product or, you know, that you would want to create or method? I like pretty much everything that Lisa was talking about. <laughs> right? I, mean, it's, I think I, uh, that's the benefit of going first. So she said all the, the really good ones. But in addition to, to that, what I would like is something that is uh, pain-free. It shouldn't have any discomfort uh, or anything that's re remotely related to pain. For example, right? So even if you talk about condoms, they're not particularly painful or any such thing. But it, it's discomfort. It's... it's uh, the, the sort of rubbing and it, there's a certain level of irritation with it. So even that level of discomfort should be avoided. So anything that's very easy to use, uh, and I'll make a pitch here for the Pop Council's own uh, product, our contraceptive vaginal ring called Anavera. This is very soft, very, it's, it's so easy to, it, there's no pain point around it at all. You can easily insert it into the vagina. It's soft, it's smooth. You wouldn't even know it's there. Uh, and uh, talk about comfort. Isn't that comfortable that you don't even know that you've got something on, right? So those are the sort of attributes I think would be important to me. All right, so I'm sure pain-free. It's something like even in the clothes, right? You want something comfortable, 
easy to wear. You don't even know that it's there. So, all right. So, the additional component from Saumya, it's pain free. How about Harriet? Are you now pressured? Because you're the last one <laughs> to 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 share what product you would like or method. <laughs> um, I I think Lisa and Samia has brought out some of the best attributes. Uh, but um, uh, in addition to that, I think that um, you know when I look at medicines generally or biomedical technologies in the sense that. They are expected to empower. They expected, you find a sick person takes a drug and finally they are jumping up and down. They've been empowered. They've been given their life back. But at the end of the day, also when you look at contraception, what you'd like to see is, is that you don't want a contraception to take over your life. You want to remain in charge of your life. So I would like a product that powers me as a person, where I don't have to depend on so many other people. Uh, something that I can also control, uh, because we all want to be in charge of our lives. So you don't want a technology to control you. You want, a, you want to control the technology and make it do things that you want to get out of it. So I think that would be important. The other thing is, of course, which my colleagues did not mention is, of course, the financial costs. You'd also want it to be affordable. Um, uh, but in, in the sense, um, and, and, and affordability in family planning is so many things. Sometimes the product is so cheap. But when you think about the cost of going to pick up a method and going for checkup, you may find that it is much more expensive than, than, than actually the products themselves. No, so how do you then balance that? How do you make sure that a woman or man is not incurring so much to access that desired product that is intended for them? Right. So those yeah. who should be developing product, they should also have a cost-benefit analysis when they do their products and you know what they're going to develop oh these are really interesting products if all of these characteristics are in that product affordable pain-free multifunctional and what else uh makes you in charge feel in charge of your life i think it would sell a lot you would earn a lot too <laughs> If you are if you're the one who's developing that product. But anyway, all right, this is a very exciting topic, but we don't have much time. But before we end, um, can I have like can I hear from each one of you like a few or your last um, message for our viewers today? What do you want to say to them as uh, your ending words or message? Should I start with who do you want to start? I don't want to put someone on the spot. Anyone? I think Saumia is wants to say something now. <laughs> sure. So first, <laughs> let me thank you and the CTI Exchange for giving us this opportunity to discuss some of these ideas, and it's uh, uh, it's it's really. I think we're at the, at the edge of science and we're trying to move the, the science as well as the field forward in, on this important topic of self-care. So, uh, so thank you for this opportunity. And um, what I could say is the, when you undertake journeys of this kind, it's always done in partnership and in collaboration with many, many people. Uh, and so just as we are collaborating with uh, with CTI and everybody else. So this is a journey that we go in partnership. And uh, so that would be my final message that to, when we all go together, we can reach our goal of improving health and uh, providing many different contraceptive options for individuals. All right. Thank you, Samia. Um, how about... Lisa? 
I want to echo Samia for thanking you all for giving us this opportunity to talk today and talk a little bit about a topic that we clearly are passionate about. I think one of the things that we hope to accomplish through this article were inspiring people to speak up. You know, valuing choice and giving people options, especially those that empower them, takes continued effort and takes money and takes individuals to maintain interest. There needs to be um, ongoing effort in order to maintain that momentum and continue the self-care movement. And we hope that people will continue to push forward because this is important. It, uh, contraception has not just value in, in um, you know, preventing pregnancy, but as a method, it can allow people to take control over their lives. And that's an exciting value that needs to continue to be front and center, especially as we, you know, create barriers such as those with COVID that have limited individuals' choice. This is something that we need to stay motivated to improve on. And, and um, I'm hoping that through collaboration, as Samia has highlighted, we can continue that movement forward and improve the lives of individuals globally. All right, thank you, Lisa and Harriet. Um, just like my colleagues, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you again for inviting us for this exchange. Um, I think uh, by talking, uh, we are able to amplify our voices around self-care, but also uh, able to create awareness about what exists out there. Now, what I really would like to end by saying is that self-care can, especially self-care in family planning, can be um, enhanced by increased choice and availability of self-administered products. Um, and I think once we have done that, we'll, get, um, we'll be able to shift access from the conventional facilities to the people who are looking for this desired service, which is family planning. Uh, it's not, a, it's, it's a service that many people are looking for right now and its availability is sort of getting diminished. So we need to do what is reasonably possible to enable other users to access this critical service as soon as possible. Thank you. All right. All right. So actually, we are the ones who should thank you, Lisa, Saumia, and Harriet, you know, for for uh, having this opportunity to listen to you and understand what self-care is and what is needed, what are needed to be able to continuously promote and achieve this self-care. So on my part, uh, uh, what what I what I my takeaway is that really technology policy, community, working together to be able to achieve that choice and uh, to be able to give that empowerment to those who need it. No barriers. Uh, hopefully, barriers will be removed soon for that one. So once again, thank you very much to uh, our colleagues from um, the Population Council. And right now, so I hope you listen once again to the next uh, series for the end in the beginning with the end in mind. And don't forget to follow CTI Exchange in their Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So thank you very much. I hope you learn. I hope the viewers learn as much as I learned today. So that's it for today. And see you soon. Bye. Thank you.